In my own research, I've seen in established companies essentially three elements in the established companies that were able to innovate, either continue innovating like a Facebook or an Airbnb, or like Intuit, who I'll mention, they lost their innovation capabilities. They were not innovating, and yet somehow they managed to turn those capabilities around. And the three things, um, which I won't cover, well, actually, I'm going to cover the three things for the next five hours. The doors are locked and nobody's getting out. Just kidding. Um, the three things are people, process, and philosophy. I'll talk about people and process mainly today and, and, and leave philosophy for another time. And in fact, I'll focus, I'm going to focus primarily on process. But I'll give you a hint about the people portion. And, and um, when I talk about process, <coughs> what I'll do, excuse me, is I'll try to synthesize some of the things you've heard today. Because one of the things I realized as I was interviewing executives and watching companies and then doing my research is that, you know what? This rising uncertainty isn't news to many disciplines. In fact, every discipline seems to have developed some sort of framework to help manage the uncertainty of innovation. You heard Lean Startup today. Well, when I was at Stanford, I was part of the group that became known as Lean Startup. So you heard some names, Eric and Steve and those kind of things. And we were trying to say, you know, the way we did entrepreneurship was, didn't work before. We were actually borrowing those traditional management tools. That's why you hit think business planning, because we used to think, well, you know, strategic planning is what big companies do, so new businesses should do that too. They should do business planning. And then we realized that doesn't work, because it's a context. Uh, starting a new business or a new innovation is a context of high uncertainty. So we, we said there's a different way to be an entrepreneur, and that became known as the lean startup. But at the same time, I was sitting there, and we created the design school across the street, and that was kind of engineering's response to uncertainty. And that offered a different set of tools. And, and by the way, so did agile software, and so did business model innovation, and open innovation, and creativity, and ideation. And so in, what we did is we said, well, how do all these things fit together? And what we found is that there are four common elements, I won't even say steps, because they don't have to be in order, of successful innovations. And we essentially synthesize the insights from creativity and ideation, open innovation, design thinking, agile software, lean startup, and business model innovation. And, and I'll tell you about these four steps for the rest of my time. The first element is this insight. And by the way, I'm going to give you the most obvious, simple labels in the world. Insight, problem, solution, and business model before you scale. That's really important, before you scale it. <coughs> and, and yet, each one of these steps had some sort of trap, which I'll explain. And then I'll show you how innovators overcame these traps, how innovators in established companies overcame this trap. So insight is uh, the thing I want you to walk away from today with is you should be trying to savor surprises. And to give you an example of what I mean, the common trap is that we are almost programmed as human beings to overlook the surprises around us. So what do I mean? <clears throat> One of my favorite examples is Corningware. The gentleman that's the crockery you've probably seen um, it's ceramic glass. It's a very hard glass, temperature resistant. And the gentleman who inv invented this very versatile product, uh, technology, was working at Dow Corning as a scientist. Very large company, working, doing an experiment in which he put a plate of glass into the oven. The oven misfires to about double its expected temperature. He walks away saying, what a waste of time. You know, when I come back, it'll just... I'll open the oven and there'll be globs of molten glass and the whole experiment will be ruined. He goes, comes, waits for the, uh, he goes away, gets some coffee, comes back, and he opens the oven and instead of globs of molten glass, there's a sheet of milky white glass. So that right there is the trap. Because he had a latent hypothesis that it would be globs of molten glass and instead he had a sheet of milky white glass. 
He totally misses it. He then takes the tongs, picks up the glass out of the oven, goes to throw it away, and by accident, the glass slips from the tongs and falls onto the concrete floor, and instead of shattering, it just rattles. He says, now that's strange. <laughs> that's different than I would have thought it would be. <clears throat> and that's the surprise that leads him to investigate what eventually becomes ceramic glass. And in my first research project, we essentially were looking at these disruptive innovators like a Jeff Bezos, like a Mark Zuckerberg, and asking the question, well, how do they get insights? Is it that they are born geniuses or is it there's something they do? Because if they're born geniuses, yeah, let's not worry about it. You know? that, we've already rolled that dice. Um, I always joke that you know, the, the one thing I would change is to be born into a wealthy family. You know, so I'd have some sort of inheritance, but uh, you can't change that, right? So we asked the question, what about these, these people allows them to have more of these surprises? And we identified that actually most of creativity is, is not how you're born. It's the habits and behaviors you engage in. And I don't have time to go in deep, so I'm just going to show you the five behaviors and give you some examples. And the five behaviors we found were associating or putting different things together. That's really what led to most of the creative ideas. And then there were four other behaviors that fed the association. And those were questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. Insights start with you and with us. It, it, we are not born creative, we, we act creative. And, um, and, and the best thing I would say as you walk away is, just be willing to savor surprises. Those are the clues about what's next. So next element is the problem. And the, the thing I want you to walk away from today is I want you to discover the job to be done. Now, here's the trap. As soon as you get that surprise, that insight about a problem we're solving, the trap is that you almost always will leap to the solution. You'll skip asking what problem am I actually solving. I will say something about when I talk about what do I mean by the problem? What do I mean by the problem is we often assume we know what problem we're solving and we look at the symptom, the symptom, the clue is what gave us the insight. But we don't actually go down and understand the root cause. And in fact, understanding the root cause is the key to building the right solution. We do run into trouble when we assume what uh, the problem is. So I mentioned this, we want to look beyond the symptoms to try to understand what's the root cause. Because you know, this woman has pain, whether she has a concussion or a tumor, very different solutions for that. And the tool I like the best to get at the root cause is an old idea uh, from what we've had around for a long time, which is called the job to be done. <clears throat> and the, the idea is very simple, and that is that we do not go to the hardware store because we want a drill. We go to the hardware store because we want a hole in the wall. And that if we had a better alternative to that hole in the wall, we would purchase it rather than waste our whole morning going to the hardware store. And the key here at the, to get at the root cause is to say, what is the customer's job to be done? And to remember that it goes beyond function. That every job has a functional, social, and emotional component. One of my favorite examples is the mechanical watch industry, which the Swiss dominated. In 1970, there was one region in Switzerland that had 40% of the global market of mechanical watches. And by 1980, the place was desolated. Digital watches had wiped them out completely. Well, sort of, right? Because actually, I live in Paris. I was, last weekend, I bought two daughters a mechanical watch. What's going on? What happened to the pattern of disruption? I'll tell you. And that is that the mechanical watchmakers tapped into something beyond function. They tapped into social and emotion. Social is how does this make me look to others. Emotion is how does it make me feel. Think about 
If you've read The Economist, you've seen these Patek Philippe ads. You never actually own a Patek Philippe. You merely look after it for the next generation. And afterwards, we'll be sailing on the yacht. I mean, they are selling prestige. It's just reeking of prestige. But they've done with that. Or they're made cool. I mean, why did my daughters buy those mechanical watches? Because they liked to see the gears. Because of the design. So in summary, I, I don't want to spend too much time. When I talk about the problem, you're trying to discover the job to be done, and you want to go beyond function. Now let me try to draw in what you heard earlier today and map it to this process. You heard Airbnb talk about the customer journey and the journey line. Those are the kinds of tools that these companies use to discover what's the job to be done. Which job should we do? What is the problem that we should be solving exactly? And using that data, then they can really design a solution that works. Where almost, you know, like uh, there's a study that said 70% of corporate initiatives go astray because they didn't first understand what problem are we solving. So once you understand what problem you're solving, then it's easier to actually design a solution. And as you heard Facebook hinting at today when they talked about lean startup, they were talking about a different approach to designing products than many of us are used to, and that is this radically rapid prototyping. And if I had you walk away with the phrase, I'd say, you want to think about the minimum awesome product, and you're like, Nathan, what does that mean? Well, let me explain. The trap in this stage is that we want to build the full-featured product from the start. And we want to do that because, of course, if we're Telenor and we launch something that is crappy, our customers will be angry, it will damage our brand. And because this is our career, nobody wants to be known for launching something really crummy. We want to be known for creating something great. But unfortunately, that is the logic of, for conditions of relative certainty. When we're under conditions of, relative, of, of high uncertainty, we want to think in terms of minimum. And, and, and to illustrate, I'm talking about really fast and frugal experiments that help us prototype our way towards amazing. And when we sat down with Jeff Bezos, he said to us, one of the things we've done at Amazon is reduce the cost of doing experiments. Very important. If you can increase the number of experiments you try from 100 to 1,000 or from 1 to 100, you fill in the blank. You dramatically increase the innovations you produce. But please do not forget, he said, you have to reduce the cost of doing the experiment to do that. Let me give you another example of uh, technology uncertainty here. This is the Google Glass, many of you know. Uh, I sat down with Tom Chi, spent some time with Tom Chi, who was the inventor who designed this, and, and he shared with me, and he did a TED Talk on it as well. <clears throat> How long do you think it took to build the first fully functional version of the Google Glass. <clears throat> if, yeah, two years. That's me. I'm like, it's going to take two years to build this and like lots of resources and all that kind of thing. One day. It took them one day to build a working prototype. It was ugly and it was crummy, but the thing about it was is that um, they used a clothes hanger for like a shirt, the wire. They used it. They bent it so it hung around your neck. And then it, there was an arm that stuck out, and it held a plastic sheet protector. And then they taped a little projector to your glasses, and it was hooked up to a laptop. And you could see something imposed on your real world. They, and, and they learned so much from that first prototype in one day. In fact, it was quite fun because the day before, they had a meeting. And uh, in this meeting, Sergey Brin's in the meeting, and Tom Chi and everybody else, and they're talking about the Google Glass. And they spent most of the meeting arguing about what color that display should be. Now, without telling you anything else about the meeting, who do you won the argument about what color that display should be? Sergey Brin, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. We call this the hippo, the highest paid opinion. Um, of course, Sergey Brin, and he said, it should be red because 
Red pho photons are the lowest energy, and so those will be the easiest on your eyes. And because in science fiction movies, the heads-up display is always red. You know, good arguments, right? You know. N he won because he was Sergey Brin. But what they discover on the next day when they build this prototype is that red is the absolute worst color. And it's because the red photons are the lowest energy. When you impose it on a room full of light, you don't see anything. So that's what I mean. These companies are moving really fast. And to do this, they are literally faking it. They are faking the functionality. And they are using what you, Facebook was talking about when they're just saying, we're trying to test and learn as fast as possible. And this is something that's already happening. These things are already happening inside of Telenor. So when I talk about figuring out what problem are you solving, I know of some projects like the Imagri project in Pakistan, which use some of these tools to understand what problem are we solving? What problems could we solve with our mobile technology for our customers, for example, farmers? And I know that in it, there's also this rapid prototyping going on because that same project used these tools. They literally faked the functionality to see will this actually solve the customer's problems. So let me just conclude to say that you do need to discover what's the right business model. And uh, the trap here is that often we assume that our existing business model applies to a new innovation, and sometimes it does. If it's more incremental innovation, it does apply. But I'll just say that you need to develop a business model that fits. And in particular, I love this example from Chodokul. I mean, sorry, from Goodredge, which is a 100-year-old manufacturing company that makes these high-end appliances that decides we need to tap into new markets. They initially think, you know, they realize 80% of Indians do not have refrigeration. So let's make a little refrigerator that's a shrunken down version of our big product. But instead of doing that, they apply the things we talked about. They go out, they under, try to understand what problem are we actually solving? Who are we solving it for? And they realize that these people live very different lives than they had assumed. And uh, they design uh, a, a very, you know, here's a prototype of, uh, it's like a cooler, you open it from the top so the cold air doesn't get out because most of these people live in you know, very high, uh, you know, it's like 32, 33 every day. The, all the electronics are in the lid, so you can take the lid to get it serviced. It's got a battery because many of these people don't have continuous power. Develop a very innovative product, and then they discover, oh, our existing business model doesn't actually fit with this. Because we have distribution centers in large cities. We use big, expensive marketing campaigns. Our customers, they're not listening to those big, expensive marketing campaigns. And they're not in those big cities. So how do we distribute it? How do we actually, what's the business model that fits this? And to make a long story short, they discover they could partner with the post office. And the post office has a distribution network that will fulfill this. And the post men are happy, postmen and women are happy to do this because they're generating initial, uh, additional revenue and it reaches all their customers and they, then they partner with some other entrepreneurial groups. But just to say that often you have to iterate your way to the right business model.